So now we're going to begin to talk about something called chordates. And chordates are the animals that basically aren't invertebrates. So invertebrates are all the animals that don't have a backbone. And chordates are all the animals that have a notochord at some point in development. So a notochord is a bit different from a vertebral column or spine. So we need to distinguish what the difference is right now. So the characteristics of chordates, there's going to be a few um, specific characteristics that you need to write down and know about chordates. So for something to be a chordate, they have to have these characteristics. All right, so the first one is a nerve cord. So you need to have a single hollow nerve cord beneath your dorsal surface, which is your back. Um, it differentiates into your, your brain and your spinal cord. So in a human, uh, your nerve cord will become your, your, will become your brain and it will become your spinal cord. Okay. The second one is a notochord. So there's this, this is an amphioxus, it's a certain type of animal. So there's this um, dorsally located uh, tube that's called a notochord. And basically all that happens is this notochord, uh, this uh, hollow cord, a uh, flexible rod, uh, develops into your spine in some animals. In other animals it doesn't turn into a spine. Uh, so the animals that it doesn't turn into a spine to are still considered chordates even though they don't have a spine. Uh, pharyngeal slits. So pharyngeal slits, they basically connect the pharynx um, with the outside uh, gills and sharks and fish um, present in terrestrial animal animals as eustachian tubes. So in us, we see it as eustachian tube. So here's the eustachian tube from a human ear. So it's located at the bottom of the middle ear and it's responsible for balance. So the pharyngeal slits become a eustachian tube in us and in other animals it becomes uh, the pharynx or the gills in sharks and fish. A postanal tail. So our tail is no longer there because um, it's become vestigial, meaning that we don't need it. Uh, there has been some cases of a tail being present in um, the, in some babies. Uh, it's obviously not very common. So a postanal tail just means that a tail extends beyond the anus and it's present at least in the embryo. It could regress. So for example, in uh, amphibians, they have a tail when they are tadpoles, but then they lose their tail later um, as they get older. Oh, and our tail is still kind of present as the cossacks. So the cossacks is basically, that's our tailbone. So when you fall and, and you may land on your bum, you hurt your tailbone. There is an extension of our spine uh, that looks like a tail, but we don't see the external representation of it. It's just internally as our skeleton. Segmentation. So we see segmentation represented in even like the earthworm we see segmentation in, but then it goes all the way up to mammals uh, like us with, you see a repeated representation of um, an arrangement of segmentation with our spinal, uh, spinal vertebrae. So they all look somewhat similar. They do change in appearance and structure, but they do somewhat look the same. So each little disc here represents a somite uh, or basically a segment of a certain location in our body. And we saw that in our earthworm, which was an invertebrate, but it's also present in vertebrates and chordates as well. All right, so groups of chordates. There's two groups of chordates. There's the chordates whose notochord doesn't turn into a spinal column, and then there's the ones whose does. So you could be a chordate and not have a vertebral column. Okay, so the examples here would be a tunicate, which is this one right here. This is a tunicate. Um, and this one over here, uh, oh, sorry. These are both tunicates. Um, and then another example would be something like this here, which is another type of fish, which uh, doesn't have the um, vertebral column, but it does have the notochord early in development. So. Tunicates would be an example of something that has a, a notochord but no spinal column. And lancelets, these uh, things right here, they also have a notochord at some point in development, but they have no spinal column. So those are the only two examples that I'm going to give you guys of non-vertebrate chordates. So these are chordates, they have notochords, but they don't turn into spinal columns. And then you have the chordates, and you're going to be very familiar with these, so these should be easier to learn about. So these are the five uh, groups of chordates, fish, amphibians, reptiles, birds, and mammals. You've seen these groups of chordates uh, very often.
Okay, so all of these animals here, their notochord turns into a spinal column. All right, so fish is the first group. So here's a bunch of different types of fish. Fish are aquatic. They have paired fins. So if there's a fin on one area, there's usually a fin in another area or an opposite area. They're, they have scales on their bodies. They have gills for breathing. They're grouped into anathostomes and nathostomes. Anathostome, well, nathostome basically means um, jawed mouth. And if you're an anathostome, that means you don't have a jawed mouth. So an animal that doesn't have a jaw would be like this one here, right here, who's a lamprey. Lampreys just basically latch onto their prey and they hang from it. And here's a hagfish. So they don't have jaws, so they are anathostomes. And this guy here, he has a jaw, and so does a shark, and so does a perch. If they have a jaw, then they're anathostomes. They have a jawed mouth. Uh, first animals, or the first fish to be created were cartilaginous. They're the older ones, like sharks. And then eventually the cartilage turned into bone, and so now we have bony fish, which are the more recent types of fish to evolve like a perch would be a bony fish. These animals are all ectothermic, which means that their body temperature um, is dictated by their surroundings. So if it's cold surroundings, then their body temperature is cold. And if it's a warm surrounding, then they're going, their body temperature is going to be warm. So this means that they're cold-blooded. Ectothermic means cold-blooded. All right, so when we look at a fish's insides, Okay, this is basically, it's the same as us. They have a lot of the same organs, just laid out a little bit differently. One of the interesting things is that they have something called a swim bladder, um, which helps them regulate their uh, osmotic conditions, like how much salt is in their body and things like that. Um, they also have to mitigate how they go up and down the water column, um, basically through diving, so they can inflate their swim bladder in order to be able to uh, go up and down the water column. This is the example of paired fins. So a dorsal fin, there's two of them. There's a pectoral fin on one side, there's one on the other side. The pelvic fin is paired with the anal fin. You have two caudal fins, um, so that's basically how they're paired. So this is what the circulatory system of a fish looks like. Uh, it's basically one giant loop. So they have only one atrium and one ventricle, as opposed to us, we have two of each. And we have a double loop circulatory system, but they only have one. So basically, blood will come through. The atrium and ventricle get pumped to the gills to pick up oxygen, then deliver it to all the tissues, then go back to the heart. Amphibians are the second group. They live in water and on land. They breathe with gills as young, and when they become adults, they use their lungs. Uh, they lack scales and claws. They have a soft, smooth skin. It's moist as well. They use their skin for breathing. They're ectothermic, which means they're cold-blooded, and their blood or their body temperature is regulated through their surroundings. They lay eggs in water, and they're externally fertilized, which means they'll lay their eggs, and then the male will put his sperm on top of the eggs to fertilize them. This doesn't happen inside the body like us. It happens outside of the body. All right, so just a couple things to go over here. Um, you should be familiar with the frog dissection already. That's what the inside of the frog looks like. You should be familiar with the outside of a frog and what external features consist of. One of the interesting things about amphibians is that they have three chambers for their heart. They have one ventricle, as opposed to two like us, and they have two atria. So they still have the double loop circulatory system, where one loop goes to the lungs and back to the heart, but they only have one ventricle where their uh, oxygenated and deoxygenated blood mix. The reptiles, they have dry, scaly skin. They still have lungs. They're terrestrial. They have amniotic eggs because they lay their eggs, and so their eggs need some kind of food to feed off of. So they'll use like a yolk. So this would be an embryo developing here. And then they have their uh, amnion surrounding it with amniotic fluid. And then they have the yolk that they use the yolk for nutrients while they're waiting to hatch. So reptiles are different from amphibians in that they do internal fertilization instead of external. Uh, they have dry, scaly skin. They're only terrestrial. Um, they lay their eggs on land, and then they have claws as well. There's four groups of reptiles, the lizards, the snakes, the crocodilians, and the turtles. So all reptiles fit into one of those four categories. This guy here is shedding his skin. So reptiles have the same circulatory system as amphibians. So it's two loops, three chambers. Then we get to the birds. So birds are pretty interesting. Uh, they have the scaly feet, which is the, um, which is kind of from the reptiles. Uh, they're endothermic, which means that they 
um, are warm-blooded. They're not ectothermic. They're warm-blooded. Um, they have feathers. They have strong chest muscles for flying, and they have strong lightweight bones. So if you were to break open a bone, you'd see that there's many pockets of air that makes their bones light, but they're still very strong. So one of the neat things about a uh, bird's respiratory system is that it actually has uh, a very unique way of breathing. So a bird will inhale through its external nares. So when it inhales, the air goes back into a posterior air sac. And then when the bird breathes, the air goes basically into the lungs from this air sac. It goes into the lungs. Then they inhale again, and the, the air goes from their lungs into an anterior air sac, which means towards the front. And then they breathe out, and the body actually leaves. So it takes like two breaths, basically, for a cycle of air to go through the body of the bird. All right, so this is just a quick uh, summary of what the inside of a bird uh, circulatory system looks like. They're like us, okay? They have four chambered hearts. So left and right atrium, left and right ventricle. And then the last group are the mammals. So mammals are characterized as having a four chambered heart. They breathe air. They have fur or fur over their body or hair, okay? They're endothermic, which means they're warm blooded. They give birth to live young. They nourish their young with milk, so this is us. Okay, these are different groups of us. Okay, if you can recognize some of these pictures here, this is a platypus, this is a naked mole rat, this is a wombat, he's considered a marsupial, and this guy here is an aardvark. There are generally three groups of mammals, these are subclasses, so under the class of being a mammal, they've made subclasses, so monotremes, marsupials, and placentals. So the monotremes are any animals that lay eggs, there's two types, there's echidna, which is what this is here, uh, and there's a platypus. Those are the only two egg-laying mammals that exist. So instead of giving birth to live young, they lay eggs, but they do all the other things. Uh, marsupials, the young are born immature. This is pretty interesting. If you ever see the birth of a kangaroo or a wombat, they basically give birth to a little naked baby almost, and then the baby crawls into the pouch and feeds off milk until it's old enough to go on its own and it comes out of the pouch. So this, examples of these would be kangaroos, koalas, and wombats. And then there's placentals, which is what we are. So placentals is when the unborn young are fed by placenta. So like, um, they're, this is an armadillo. So what would happen is, as the baby's developing, um, it's still inside the mom, and it's being fed through a placenta. So it's basically a network of blood vessels with the Wastes are taken away from the baby, and all of the nutrients and food are brought into the baby. So monotremes, egg laying, marsupials, you have immature young born, which need to develop outside of the womb. And then this is where the development occurs inside the womb, and the baby is supported through a placenta. Okay, and as you guys know, we have a double loop, four-chambered heart, and you've already gone over all the circulation for us. That's it. That's the end of your course.